So it is. The Lakers have traded Timothy Mozgov and who? D'Angelo Russell, Russell to the Nets. To the Nets. For Brooke Lopez and the 27th pick. And here's what he said. D'Angelo is an excellent player. He has the talent to be an all-star. Right. We want to thank him for what he did for us. But what? what I needed was a leader. I needed somebody also that can make the other players better. And also somebody that players want to play with. D'Angelo wasn't that fit for you guys. Well, I think, uh, you know, to, to be perfectly blunt, the fit was questionable when we signed him, I, but nobody questioned that. Uh, when you already have Steph and Clay, uh, and you add a, a, a ball dominant guard, you can rightfully question the fit. Ah, uh, my dog. You know it's a celebration, Shorty. You know what it is. My dog, every time. This shit's sick, bro. I got coats. Oh, I got you this. <laughs> ah, let me see it. All right, man. I never wanted to make this video for obvious reasons, but it has to be done. If I had to explain what exactly is happening to D'Angelo Russell's career so far, I would simply say the NBA is clearly leaving him behind. Something I absolutely love about professional sports is the urgency of it. You don't have a long time to prove your worth in these sports. People say that the NFL stands for not for long. Well, I think the NBA is way worse in that aspect because it's simply way less opportunities. I always say the NBA stands for no bullshit allowed because that's exactly what it is. The average NFL career is about three years, give or take. The average NBA career is about four years, give or take. But when you take into account that the NFL has 32 teams, six annual draft picks, 22 starters, and up to 53 players per roster, and you compare that to the NBA with two annual draft picks, 30 teams, five starters, and about a fourth of the NFL's players, you can see the urgency to perform in the NBA is it's a little bit more extreme. There's only five players per team on the court at one time. So the one or two that doesn't perform well, they clearly stand out. I say all this because even though D'Angelo Russell is clearly talented enough to play in this league, him being a number two pick with inconsistent play mixed with some BS he's had off the court and now the fact that there's a real chance he can play for five teams before his 26th birthday, it simply proves my theory correct. No BS allowed. I don't care where you was drafted. Now, in my opinion, D'Angelo Russell's career got off to an unideal start before he even took one dribble in the NBA. When you look around this league and you really, really look at it, most of the young point guards that's thriving in this league typically have one thing in common, small market teams. This is a factor that some people may laugh at or scoff at or not even take serious, but I think it's very underrated and not talked about enough. Being on a small market team typically leads to way less immediate expectations and attention, and it typically gives you a lot more time to grow at your own specific pace. Look at the top point guards in this league and look at where they got drafted to. If you want to start with the vets, let's start with Stephen Curry. I think the best thing that happened to Stephen Curry's career is the fact that he didn't go to New York. Could you imagine Stephen Curry with those early hurdles and injuries that he battled in New York? The patience, the growth, the development, it would not have been the same. Dame in small market Portland. I believe subconsciously that's why he doesn't want to leave. If he goes somewhere like New York, Philadelphia, or if he joined the Lakers with LeBron, the expectations go through the roof. It's a lot more comfortable to sit there in Portland. Chris Paul got drafted to a relatively small basketball market in New Orleans with no basketball history. Uh, Russell Westbrook, he went to OKC with no expectations. Even if you look at the new age point guards, it's damn near the exact same. LaMelo Ball, the small market Charlotte Hornets, John Morant, Memphis, De'Aaron Fox, Sacramento, Trey Young, Atlanta with the basketball scene honestly isn't too crazy. I live in Atlanta and I've been to multiple games, even the season opener this year. There were endless open seats. Um, Donovan Mitchell, the Utah Jazz. All these players playing in small markets play to their benefits. Not too many national televised games, not too many expectations and time to grow. 
I specify point guards because point guards typically have the most responsibilities and the least room for error. So their jobs are extremely hard. Name me the last great point guard drafted by the New York Knicks. You probably can't because you probably haven't seen it in your lifetime. Me neither. Who was the last number one pick point guard and how exactly did they do? Markel Fultz, a player I went to elementary and middle school with and I really wanted him to succeed. But he went to Philly where the hype was clearly growing, the market was thriving and expectations, they were immediate. There wasn't time to grow. Fans, they wanted results damn near instantly. Your two years here, obviously so much has happened since then. But when you look back on your two years here, what comes to mind first? It was a blur. It was a blur, to be honest. Um, came here. I remember Kobe more than anything, you know, the, the, the Kobe um, farewell tour, you know, getting to be a part of that and, and, and see that and see the respect that he had around the league. I've always been like, I wanted that, you know, um, so that's really the main thing. Now that I laid that out, just to add a little bit of context to how difficult this stuff could be, let's look at D'Lo's career. The Lakers surprised everybody by not drafting who people thought was the best player in that draft, Jaleel Okafor, and they draft D'Angelo Russell number two. D'Lo made his name at Ohio State for his unique size, drawing comparisons to Penny Hardaway, his shot creation, and of course, his passing. He unfortunately even drew comparisons to Magic himself, the absolute worst thing that can possibly happen to a point guard drafted by the Lakers. Also, do you remember the situation he joined as a point guard in his rookie year? If you don't, let me refresh your memory. Kobe Bryant was in his final season closing out that historic career with the Los Angeles Lakers. This clearly hindered certain opportunities for D'Lo in his rookie year, and it's a tough situation playing beside an icon like Kobe trying to play point guard for him in his last year. It's, it's just tough. And no, this wasn't a situation like Kevin Garnett mentoring Cat when Kevin Garnett was washed. This was Kobe Bryant having the greenest light of any player maybe ever, and he utilized it. That's, that's Kobe. And if you don't believe me, bro, check this out. That season, Kobe averaged a team-high 17 shots per night, and he did it in only 28 minutes per game. That was 15th in the league as far as shots per game, and out of everybody in the top 30, Kobe was the only one that didn't play 30 minutes a night at least. Now, if you adjust it to per 36 minutes, the exact amount of minutes per night that Kobe averaged for his career, Kobe would have led the league in shots as far as a calculated pace. Also, if you look at Kobe's usage rate that year, he was fourth in the entire league. So that just gives you a little bit of context of what D'Lo was going through in his rookie year. Then when you look at his second year, playing with multiple players that turned out to be extremely productive in today's NBA, D'Lo's season that year, it was just extremely riddled by injuries. He had that frustrating cycle of playing 12 games, then missing eight playing 20 games, then missing five, stuff like that. And for a player that literally lives and dies by that jump shot, bro, that's tough. And you can't develop any type of rhythm like that. Even if you look at that specific season where he actually had a little bit of continuity in his games played, he had stretches where he looked like a developing player on the rise. But when you look at him coming off of injuries, knees, calves, and stuff like that, his production clearly slipped. This cycle is dead as the theme of his career and it continued as soon as he got to Brooklyn. His first season in Brooklyn is not remembered for good reasons because he barely played. But actually, his first 12 games, he looked pretty solid and honestly, like he was having that breakout year. But then he gets hurt, has to miss 32 games off a of knee surgery, and he comes back a complete shell of himself. To no one's surprise, his best season was actually his second year in Brooklyn, which happened to be his healthiest year. Actually playing 81 games allowed him to develop his confidence with his shot off the dribble, and him and Jared Allen actually became a pretty deadly duo with that pick and roll. The problem with this season, and pretty much the growing narrative of his career, is yeah, that season was cool, but it's kinda Westbrook-like. D'Angelo went off, and he was extremely clutching that year, like it felt like he was winning games every other week, but it was on a low expectation team with limited talent in a high volume situation where he played that floor raiser role. So it's like, I mean, yeah, you can make a bad team good, but can you actually elevate a good team? But here's where his career getting left behind, it strikes again. 
directly after his best season with Brooklyn, just like LA, they exploit what they believe to be a better chance of winning a championship. And somehow D'Lo winds up in Golden State. At this point, he's just wasting his career with the Warriors. Clearly, he never fit. Clearly, he was always a project while their real team was recovering. And eventually, he's moved again for what seems to be a way better opportunity at a championship. Once he gets to Minnesota, the player he's clearly most excited to play with only shares the court with him one time that whole season. And the following year, they only played a third of the season together after D'Lo once again had a knee surgery. And bringing it up to now, where D'Lo has already missed a third of his possible Minnesota career games due to injuries, and his game seems to have declined so much that he's barely effective when he's there. Right now, and I know all my Minnesota fans that constantly hit me up and watch these videos and all that stuff, y'all definitely understand. It's like his game is literally just spurts and moments of what we've seen in 2019, and the rest is just bad, inconsistent play. One of D'Lo's problems, even entering the draft, was always his lack of aggression attacking the basket, a problem I feel like stems from his lack of athleticism, and consequently, his defense as well. Now, you add multiple surgeries to that bad left knee, with him never really being the best natural athlete, and essentially, he's a one-dimensional player relying on a mid-range jumper and bad-looking threes when they don't fall. Chris Paul is a clear example of a player that doesn't attack the basket much, but he has one of the deadliest mid-range games of all time, and his decision-making is second to none, so he still can be extremely effective. I say D'Lo's career got left behind because honestly, every team that moved past him eventually were better off. Also, and I don't really understand this, but it just seems like it's bad luck. Every new team he's been on, for some reason, it seems like his career started with that new team in his second year. With the Lakers, his first year was kind of Kobe, you know, it was a Kobe-like theme season, so it really started his second year. Brooklyn, his first year with Brooklyn, he was injured, so it really started his second year, then he got traded. Golden State, I don't even count that. Minnesota, his first two years were damn near destroyed by injuries, and it's really starting this year. It just feels like he's always playing catch up, trying to get back to where he once was, and the league is just quickly moving past him. We're getting like two new elite point guards every year, so as they come in, D'Lo's stock, it slides down. Now, I don't think D'Angelo Russell just can't play or anything like that, and he is still my favorite player. I just believe he's probably best as a six man running the second unit, and I think he will thrive there. Last year, he got hurt, had to come off the bench when he came back, and he looked productive. To me, that was the most productive he's looked since his last year in Brooklyn. There's nothing wrong with that Manu Ginobili type of role. Left-hander, I mean, I can see it. Six man of the year, possibly, I can see it, bro. So, like I said, I think on a bad team, he can possibly start, but on a good team, he's probably best off the bench as a six man. If you guys like this video, please, please like this video. Trust me, this was probably the hardest video I made of my career, like of my YouTube career. This is probably the hardest one I ever had to make. So please like the video. Um, like I said, man, follow my social media sites, turn on post notifications. D'Lo, please, please, please play better, bro. Please, if you watching this, bro, please play better. Follow my social media sites, do that great stuff, guys. Until next time, as always, <sighs> stay tuned.